and that's what happened and shit kept burning down <laughs> the channel my name is kennedy if you're new here if you're not new hey girl how you been welcome back to another true crime and makeup video here on the channel my name is kennedy if this is your first time here i am your resident true crime baddie because we are true crime baddies with the shoulder uh, over here <laughs> make sure you subscribe if this is your first time here because you're gonna love it we have a lot of fun it's morbid but it's fun I'm currently pre-filming so I can get ahead of the content because it's a lot of content coming in G August. This is July. We're in July right now. You guys won't see this video until August, but I'm coming at ya. I had a lot of fun this summer and I was able to relax a lot and spend time with my kids without having to worry about money and going to work. To be totally transparent, I've had a really amazing summer with my kids, relaxing, taking time off from work. I'm on a two week vacation from my day job and um, I wouldn't have been able to do any of that without you guys. So I'm so happy, so thankful to have the financial freedom to take two weeks off from work and to chill at home with my kids. I've done nothing but cook breakfast and take my kids out and just hang out and be lazy around the house with them these past few days and it's been amazing i'm so relaxed i feel like you maybe can hear it in my voice i just feel so at peace so thank you guys so much i'm so grateful you for i can't talk i'm so grateful to you guys for you guys and because you guys pour so much into me there is a lot of content coming next month so that i can pour back into you Sitting down and talking to you guys, as I tell you all the time, makes me so excited. I'm so happy to be here. I love our platform, the True Crime Baddies. And before we hop into today's case, we've got a quick word from a sponsor. Shout out to Liquid IV for partnering with us on today's video. I took Liquid IV with me on my family vacation. We went to the beach into a water park. And let me tell you, it was exactly what we needed to stay hydrated on this super hot trip. Hey guys, I'm coming at you from my vacation. to exactly to tell y'all how liquid iv had my back this entire trip my wig did not survive but the liquid iv came in clutch okay the new energy multiplier this one is in the yuzu pineapple flavor it's so good first of all but but i don't think i would have been able to function on this trip with both kids at a water park and slides and lazy hey. rivers it totally came in clutch. These energy multipliers are equivalent to one to two cups of coffee and definitely gave me the boost I needed to function as a human being on this trip. <laughs> I even met a mom at the pool yesterday. She was like, girl, what are you drinking? What do you put in your water? I was like, it's an energy boost. Do you want one? Do you need two? Do you need three? I've got a whole pack. I got you. Yeah. And obviously the regular uh -huh. liquid IV is uh -huh. Hi, baby. <laughs> it's helping keeping us hydrated. So shout out to Liquid IV for sponsoring today's video and keeping me afloat on this trip with the kids, right? Right. right. <laughs> Dehydration multiplier hydrates you two times faster than just water by itself. So this is something that I definitely need as someone who is constantly forgetting to drink water. If you haven't tried Liquid IV, be sure to check it out through the links in the description. And once again, shout out to them for partnering with us on today's video. All right, thank you guys so much for being with me through this little summer break and the sponsors and everything. I love you guys so much and we can hop into today's case. <laughs> hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. Um, I don't know if y'all heard that. My toddler is right there on the floor. Yeah, y'all will probably hear him throughout the video because I'm just kind of letting him do his thing while I film. I normally like put him in the high chair if he's home while I film, but today we're gonna test it out. We're gonna see how he does, okay? You gonna do okay? Uh -huh. Hi. Uh -huh. Hi, baby. We're gonna hop right in today because I don't know if y'all remember earlier in a couple videos back I said that I was working on a long video that was gonna take a long time to film and probably be the longest video I've ever made because there's a lot of information. This is that video. <laughs> I stopped doing my brows when I realized like that takes up a lot of time because I was like I need to do my brows on camera since we're gonna be here for a minute. So. Today we're talking about the Pillow Pyro, as he was dubbed in the media. He was a serial arsonist in the late 80s, early 90s, who damn near burned down half of Southern California. Prosecutors claim the former got sexual gratification out of setting fires. 
you know, it's very disappointing to work with someone and think that uh, they have the same motivations that you do and find that they don't. I think this is the first time we've covered a serial arsonist on the channel, I think. But these are some of the most interesting cases to me and we can get into it. Boom. So October 10th, 1984 is the date of our first fire. This fire took place in an Olds hardware store. It's O-L-E apostrophe S. I've heard some people say Ole's and I've heard some people say Olds to me. That's Olds, but. But this fire took place in a hardware store and he was dubbed the Pillow Pyro by the media because he liked to set fires in hardware stores, in um, like sewing supply, craft stores, <clears throat> because he would like to use materials made out of polyurethane. So when you think polyurethane, think like sponges, pillow stuffings, mattress protectors, that spray foam, <clears throat> excuse me, like the spray foam, anything like that is polyurethane. It catches fire very easily. And once it catches fire, it spreads rapidly. Now this old hardware store in particular it used to be like a grocery store and something else within a strip mall and you know how sometimes in strip malls like the separate stores are separated by these big rolling like doors like these big rolling metal doors. I never knew this until looking into this case but those big rolling metal doors are to stop fires from spreading. So if there's a fire in one part of the building, the big metal doors drop down to stop the fire from going into the other parts of this building. However, however, in this instance, the fire doors would drop and unfortunately trap some people within this store. So let's get into it. All right, so employees and customers are obviously in the store on the night in question when um, someone realizes that there's a small fire and there's smoke and so they take a pretty calm approach. They start to evacuate the store. Employees go around looking for customers to get people out, let them know, you know, there's a fire and we're evacuating the store. So like I said, once these fires start, they spread very rapidly. So one employee gives his account of seeing a small amount of smoke coming from one area so he goes to the very back of the store and he finds a grandmother and her grandson on this back aisle and he lets them know you know we're evacuating there's a fire you know grab your grandson up out of the basket and we're going to move towards the exit and as he is leading them back out the way that he had came he realizes that the small amount of smoke he had seen before was now a raging fire and so he knows that he can't take the family out this way, but as he goes towards the big metal fire doors, they drop. So unfortunately, he and the grandmother and the grandson are caught between the big metal doors that they cannot get up and the raging fire on the other side of them. And as if things couldn't get any worse, the lights within the hardware store go out totally pitch black and they are surrounded by fire unfortunately the man who works at the hardware store and the grandmother and grandson they get separated this man because he works at the hardware store is able to feel around and he makes it to a back wall and once he makes it to this back wall he's able to feel his way out and he makes his way outside of the hardware store He's absolutely taken aback when he gets outside of the store and looks back to see that it is totally engulfed in flames. Like this is not the small fire that they had originally thought it to be. The hardware store was totally engulfed in flames. And in a matter of only about five minutes, this 12,000 square foot store, which to put it to perspective, like if you search 12,000 square feet homes, on Zillow, you're gonna see like a multi-million dollar like estate. Like this is a huge property. In only about five minutes, this fire had totally consumed this store. People from the street who were watching the fire unfold, as well as like firemen on the scene, said that smoke was coming up out of the vent on the roof. That's how big this fire was. And unfortunately, not everyone made it out alive. There were a couple casualties. The grandmother and grandson, Ada and Matthew, they died in the fire from smoke inhalation just 20 feet away from the exit. And our other two victims, 
Caroline Cross and Jimmy Satina were both younger adults who worked at this hardware store and who were said to have been outside of the fire at the time that it started, but eventually died as a result of smoke inhalation and the process of going back in and trying to help people out of the fire. So of course, fire and arson investigators are sent out to look at this crime scene and they determine this fire to be an electrical fire. They said it's not arson, it was an electrical fire and that's it, they move on. However, one person in particular, a man by the name of John Orr, who was a very well-respected arson investigator and fire chief in the Glendale area, he insists that this was not an electrical fire, that it was in fact arson, and he urged LA Fire to look into it deeper. He even told the victim's families that this was definitely arson and that they should also be pressing local fire and arson investigators to look into this matter deeply because he did not think that this was just a regular fire. And it's also said because they were kind of like in a rush to clean this scene up, get the mess out of the way and get back to business as usual. The machinery they were using to clear this land up and clear out the burnt remains of the hardware store really destroyed a lot of evidence before a real thorough investigation could have been done. So even though John Orr had these concerns, they couldn't really look into them because they had started cleaning up the scene already. The most crazy, outlandish, ridiculous thing is that on the night of the hardware store fires, there were two other smaller fires. And this is how the Pillow Pyro also got dubbed the Frito Bandito. Frito Bandito in the media because it seemed as though when big fires started, they would also start other smaller fires, often in grocery stores on the potato chip aisle. They light these small fires to kind of disperse firefighters. And it would be the smaller fire first or a series of smaller fires first and then the one big fire, okay? But they didn't connect these dots at first. And of course, the Olds fire, like I said, was not labeled an arson to begin with. So they do not link the Olds fire to the two separate grocery store potato chip aisle fires. But they do, however, decide that these two fires are arson but they just assume that it's like a petty theft maybe trying to steal some groceries you know you light a fire on this side of the store and then walk out with some meat and potatoes on the other side of the store that kind of thing and also because the fires at the grocery stores were so petty they thought in no way could it have been the same perpetrator like this big huge fire that gussed up within five minutes and these two little potato chip fires they just assumed that there was no way it could be the same perpetrator which is kind of a fucked up assumption to make like i mean they're all fires and they all happened on the same night and one of the grocery stores was only 15 minutes away from the old hardware store how this was overlooked i don't know I don't know, but it was overlooked, okay? Lots of people feel as though if these three fires had been linked from the beginning that maybe things wouldn't have got to the level that we're gonna talk about later in the video, but hindsight is 2020. All right, y'all, and just two months later and another Ohl's hardware store is another fire. Luckily for detectives, this fire does not ignite or the incendiary device is found before it's able to, to fuck shit up okay so so their incendiary device is a lit cigarette okay and this lit cigarette has matches like a rubber band wrapped around it so that the perpetrator can light the cigarette and the cigarette will burn down giving him time to escape before the cigarette burns down enough to light the matches and this little device is placed inside of a piece of notebook paper so once the matches catch on fire they light the notebook paper and like i said before our perpetrator is sticking these devices into highly flammable materials inside of these hardware stores 
So this is a great leg up for detectives. And so like before, you know, this fire in a, this second Olds hardware store reignites, no pun intended, John Orr's, you know, feeling that this is arson. Y'all need to look into this. But again, they kind of just let it go. You know, they have more fire, some fires where they feel like they can't tell if it's arson or accidental, but nothing that stirs up a big investigation until January of 1987. There is a fire at a craft store called Craftsmart in Bakersfield, California. Y'all know how like the craft stores will have the dried up like flower petals. So this fire started in some dried up petals. And when the fire chief comes to check the fire out, he finds another one of those incendiary devices. The cigarette wrapped up in the matches, wrapped up in the notebook paper. And so after they find this device, they decide to stick around and ask them questions. And as they're asking questions, they're asking employees and anybody who was in the store at the time of the fire, when they get word that there has been another fighter in another department store, so they rush out to that scene and it's as they are investigating this second fire that they realize these two fires were a part of a string of fires and they're finally starting to put two and two together okay so they started in fresno california there was one in tulare california and then the one down in Bakersfield. And why this finally stuck out to detectives and firefighters in the area is because there was a fire conference in Fresno. And the fire started in Fresno and then traveled down the highway as if a firefighter who had attended this conference had set fires his whole way home. Now this is a stretch, this is a long shot, but it's also seeming like, you know, a really big coincidence. And it would make a lot of sense as to why they keep having all these fires and they can't necessarily put their finger on who's starting them, what's starting them, where they came from. It's because it was a firefighter who was starting them. And so they have this hunch and at this point, you know, it's their only lead, okay? And so what they decide to do is they test the incendiary device that is found at the scene of the fire in Bakersfield and they want to see if they can get any kind of DNA or fingerprints or anything lifted from this incendiary device and luckily they are able to pull a fingerprint. So what they decide to do is take this fingerprint and match it against the people who attended the fire conference. You see where I'm going? You see? Yeah, it's good detective work. Now they have this amazing idea, this amazing technique, but there were so many people at this conference that they have to narrow it down. So they narrow it down to people who came to the conference and left the conference alone because they know that arsonists, you know, they usually travel alone. It's not like a thing people do together. It's a very secretive, like one person in and out, in and out type of deal. And so from there, they narrow it down even more to people who were traveling the same route as the fires had took. So from Fresno to Tulare, to Bakersfield, okay? And they're unable to narrow it down to 55 people. And the detectives say that it's just too many, too many fingerprints to go through, too much work that it's it's not something they can do. Huh. So detectives decide not to look into it and the one fire chief whose like idea this was and who narrowed down this list was told to, you know, to just leave it alone, let it go, drop it. And that's what happened and shit kept burning down. And things keep burning down until March of 1989 when there is another fire conference in Pacific Grove, California, all right? And after this conference, there is another set of fires going south down away from the conference as if somebody is leaving the conference, going back home and setting shit on fire on their way home. Sounds extremely familiar, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, and so the same firefighter 
who had made the first list and narrowed it down to 50 people took this list and compared it to the list of people who were also at this second conference and pulled both, you know, names that were on both lists and narrowed it down to only 10 people. And so he goes back to the original detectives and he's like, okay, well this time I have 10 names. Can you run 10 names? Can you compare like the 10 sets of fingerprints? And they agreed to do so, but unfortunately there is no match. On this huge lead that they finally thought would bust this case wide open, there is no match. All right, so this brings us to June of 1989. Southern California is on fire, okay? They're having a very dry season. The wildfires are going crazy. And, you know, the fire department's resources are spread very thin during this time. This spring, and on June 10th in the College Hills area of Glendale, California, a huge fire breaks out in this residential area. It said that because it was so windy, the fire started down below and the wind pushed this fire up this hill and burned down all the houses in its path. This fire would prove to be the largest fire in Glendale's history. Bystander said that houses were bursting into flames like fireworks. And John Orr is at the scene again, insisting that this fire was arson. And because they knew they had an arsonist and somebody who was quite frankly not scared to burn the whole damn city down. And because this last fire spread through such a vast area, I even read an account that the Glendale fire stretched across an eight lane highway. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's just like a size comparison or what, but I even read that, but this was a huge fire. So they decided to set up a tip line. And so John Orr is in charge of following up on tips, seeing what's credible, seeing what's not. Basically everything that comes through the tip line funnels through John Orr. And so then, even after the College Hill fires, there was another series of three fires that all happened in the same day. And this was finally enough for detectives and fire professionals in the area to put together a task force. If you ask me, the force should have been tasking a long time ago. Like, what the hell? A lot of stuff didn't burn down before y'all decided to put a task force together. But regardless, the first thing this task force sets out to do is reach out to other fire departments in the area, smaller towns, to see if they can come up with any other crime scenes that are similar. And within a day of research, they're able to find 30 other fires with similar MOs, you know, during the middle of the day, a crowded store, nobody really seeing anything or recognizing anything. The chip backfires, they find the incendiary device, like 30, 30 fires. I don't like that I just be sitting here and I can't find the stuff that I just had. Like it, it, the table is only so big. These other 30 fires are also in like the hardware store types, craft stores, fabric stores, all within the time span of about 14 to 16 weeks, you guys. And once they form this task force, this is when the math finally starts mathing for them, okay? And at this point, they still have a hunch that a firefighter is the one starting these fires. So remember how the first time they matched the fingerprints on the incendiary device against people who attended the conference? This time, they tested these fingerprints against anyone, any firefighter who was close to any of these scenes. And they come back with a match to John Orr. The fingerprints found on the incendiary device that was found in that craft store near the dried flowers was John Orr's fingerprint. And because John Orr is this well-respected fire chief and arson investigator, their original train of thought is that, you know, well, he just touched the evidence like he needs to stop touching and handling evidence. But they bring this to the fire chief that had found the incendiary device, the one who was there that day, the one who made all these lists. And he said, John Orr was nowhere near the scene 
when we found that device, his fingerprint should be nowhere on it. You know, he should have never even seen it. And so this is obviously like red flags are flying. John Orr is their first lead. And because he was not at the scene of this fire where the incendiary device with the fingerprint was found, they think he is their number one suspect. They know that they need to keep this under wraps and keep the task force small keep it like on a need to know basis and they lay low until there is another fire conference. It's April 1991 and they find out that John Orr is attending another conference. So they decide to follow him in secret and they put a tracking device on his car. So what they do is they originally follow him by car and by plane. There's a car and a plane following him to Abisbo, California, where this third conference is taking place. And he is speeding through the highways, going like 90 to 100 miles an hour the whole way there. He's very hard to follow, but they don't think that he is suspicious of them. So when he parks at his hotel, they wait until like the middle of the night to place the tracking device on his car. Now, one place they follow him to is a little drugstore, corner store type of deal. And he's in and out pretty quick. So of course, detectives wanna know like, what was he in the drugstore doing? What did he buy? And so after he's gone, they follow up with the clerk at the drugstore and they say, you know, well, what did he just purchase? And they said he bought a soda and a pack of cigarettes. Now this stands out to detectives because remember, these people know John Orr and a big part of John Orr's personality, something that he makes a personality trait of his, um, is that he hates cigarettes, he hates smoking. Remember this is the late 80s, early 90s, everybody was smoking cigarettes, but not John Orr. He was disgusted by cigarettes, hated them, okay? So it was a huge red flag that he was buying cigarettes. Remember that's a huge component of our incendiary device. And so they know that because he bought these cigarettes, he's getting ready to start some more fires, okay? And they get this really big lead of him buying the cigarettes, so they know they need to keep up with him, stay close to him. But John Orr decides to run his car through the car wash. And when he comes out of the car wash, he notices wires hanging from the back of his car. The tracking device had came loose and the wires were just dangling at the bottom. But luckily for detectives, again, he thinks it's a bomb, okay? He does not think <laughs> it's a tracking device, he thinks it's a bomb. Like I would definitely think tracking device before I thought bomb, but I've also had somebody put a tracking device on my car before. So maybe I'm just traumatized, I don't know. <laughs> so when they realize that the tracking device has come loose, and that John Orr has somehow found it. They have to ring the alarms and let the people know in the area, local police departments, that kind of thing, that, hey, this is not a bomb, it's a tracking device, this is a suspect, and a huge case like, just tell them you don't know what it is, but don't tell them it's a tracking device. Luckily, they're able to make this announcement and let everybody know before he's able. So the bomb technicians tell John that it's like a hoax, it's a joke device, like somebody's just trying to fuck with you haha <laughs> it's a joke and John believes it and he goes on about his life and so as they're looking into John Orr by way of his secretary they come oh I knocked my damn I knocked my jewel off my head anyway by way of his secretary they realize that John had been writing a book okay and he had been writing about a serial arsonist in Southern California who had been burning down hardware stores. And the book starts, his little manuscript for this book starts by saying, everything that I'm writing is fiction, even though it don't sound like it. And in his little fiction novels, he was describing these crime scenes and the past couple of fires and the fires that had happened over these years to a T. He had changed the name of the stores, but everything else was these fires down to a T. The name of his little book was called Points of Origin, which is a common term used in like the firefighter, fire investigation, used to describe, you know, where your fire started, what started the fire, that kind of thing. Your point of origin for the fire. 
So one thing that stands out in these books is that he mentions the first fire that we talked about at the old hardware store that killed the mother or the grandmother and her grandson. In the book, he even references these people, the grandmother and the grandson. And there's also a grandfather that was with them on the night of the fire as well. In John's book, he says that the little boy's favorite flavor of ice cream is mint chocolate chip and that they and that they had gone for mint chocolate chip ice cream before going to the hardware store. So what they do obviously is they take this information and they go to the grandfather who was with them that night. And he says, you know, well we hadn't gone to get ice cream yet, but we had told the little boy in the hardware store, you know, if you're very good in here, if you behave, when we're done, we will take you to get some mint chip ice cream because that's your favorite. We'll take you to Baskin Robbins. So what they theorize is that John Orr was in this store while these while while these grandparents were having this conversation with this little boy and lit the store on fire fucking anyway. And that is just so sick and twisted to me. And if I sit here and think about it for too long, I'm going to pull my weave off. So what they decide to do from here is take John Orr's pictures to employees of these stores that are burned down and witnesses to see if anybody recognized him. One lady said she saw him on the day of the fire and multiple times before that, as soon as 15 minutes before the fire, he was in and out of these stores, scoping his crime scenes out, seeing the people in these stores every day and lighting them on fire anyway. And so John Orr takes one more opportunity to make himself look extremely guilty. So he's out teaching a class with a fellow arson investigator in the area near the Warner Brothers like filming lot. You know, the big one that they show him like the beginning of the movie, that big old lot, he was there, okay? Or he was near there, I'm sorry. And later that day, there is a fire on the lot and it initially looks like arson and it just so happens that the man that he was teaching this class with is the arson investigator who was called out onto the scene and so obviously he calls his friend and colleague john orr to help him take a look at this scene because at this point he does not yet know about the investigation into john orr because they were keeping it under such tight wraps okay and so this is the Warner Brothers movie lot where they film all these movies. And so John Orr says, okay, well, I'll come out there, but how should I get onto the lot? Like, what do I need to do? This other arson investigator tells him, you know, just wait at the gate and I'll come grab you from the gate. So this arson investigator is waiting at the gate for John Orr and he's waiting and he's waiting, but John Orr isn't at the gate. And so he calls him on the radio and he's like, hey, John, I'm at the gate, where are you? And John says, oh, well, I'm already at the scene. And it's weird, obviously, because John originally said that he didn't know how to get onto the lot at all, but when he radioed back, he was already at the scene. Red flags, red flags, red flags, okay, red flags. But then they later find out that John Orr frequented the Warner Brothers lot a lot because his wife worked there so he would be there with her for lunches and that kind of thing he frequented the lot a lot and he you know knew very well how to get on and off of the lot so why are you lying so with this it's enough for them to go ahead and arrest john orr for all of these arsons jesus is such a long laundry list of bullshit they think he is guilty of doing but um, he is arrested. They are able to go through his belongings because they want to see if they can find more of these little books he's been writing. But one major thing they come across is film and photos. They find, <clears throat> they find multiple videos of these fires, these huge fires before first responders or anybody had even made it to the crime scene. So how is he filming these scenes and filming these fires? before first responders and firefighters even knew they were happening. And then there was like these before and after pictures. He would take pictures of homes before he set them on fire and then during the fire. They go through his background and see that John Orr had originally aspired to be a police officer, but he could not pass the psychological evaluation. And he had also applied to other fire departments and couldn't get a job there because he could not pass the psychological evaluations. And he ended up in Glendale because they seemed to be like 
a struggling fire department at the time and they were kind of taking anybody and that's how he ended up at Glendale even though his mind wasn't where it needed to be. He also bragged about once he got to Glendale, he arrested more people for arson than they had in the past seven years in the short time that he had been there. And I'm just feeling like maybe he was framing people. Once they have him arrested initially, he's trying to go out to his car and go to work on like a normal day and they arrest that ass, okay? But he spends six years in and out of court, in and out of jail, on and off on house arrest because they are prosecuting him for as many as of the fires as they can before prosecuting him for the four counts of murder as a result of the first fire and they want to wait to do this one last because they want to convict him of as many arsons as they can so when they get to this final fire they got all of this to back it up like all of these arsons all this that he was guilty of there was no way that he didn't do this one does that make sense like they wanted to stick it to his ass make sure that um he got these four counts of murder because you know he could get up to 30 years for their, the other arsons but obviously these murders would carry life sentences death sentences okay so that is the game plan and during this time he's doing all these interviews with like inside edition people magazine like he is in the media given r kelly fighting for his life okay knowing damn well he's guilty they also bring up the book that he had written and also he loses a lot of his credibility with his family because they a lot of things just nasty things come out about him during this time because which i didn't know but because pyromania is like a sexual thing like people are pyromaniacs and arsonists because they get off on it i had no idea those two things were linked but apparently it is they they assume that he had other like devious sexual activities going on and in um one of his little books that he wrote he um talked about tying up a girlfriend and you know just weird shit so they decided to dig into that um turns out that he wasn't faithful in a lot of his relationships that he even tried to leave the wife that he was with during the time of all these fires and during the time of the trials um he just wasn't the best guy his wife said that he had one time smothered her with a pillow and then pulled out a gun and pressed the gun to the pillow and told her he was gonna blow her fucking brains out like you know that kind of guy okay not the best in the process of you know working up to this murder trial pled guilty to three like a string of three fires um like he took a plea deal type of thing so his attorney's defense in the murder trials is that he had already confessed to all the fires he'd already done so there's no way that he could have done this one because if he would have done this one he would have just confessed to it too But ultimately justice is served and it takes a jury a long time. It takes them about three weeks of deliberation, but ultimately he is found guilty of the four counts of first degree murder and a laundry list of arson charges, a l ar arson, arson, ar arson. It would be too much for us to sit here and like go through all of them. The most important thing is that he is convicted of the four counts of first degree murder. And he is sentenced to 20 years to a life in prison. He is spared the death penalty because his daughter takes the stand and pleads for her dad's life, basically. And talks about how important it is for her grand for her son, John's grandson, to have a relationship with him and how she still would like to visit him in jail and how she didn't want him to get the death penalty. That kind of thing, which John should have shot thought about before he killed a grandmother and her grandson. It's, it's given karma. It's given he should have got the death penalty. She don't, she don't get to see her grandson. You don't get to see yours. Tip for tat. But I don't know. I'm petty. He gets to see his grandson. He gets to just enjoy breathing and being alive. And that's more than our families are going to be able to do. So John Orr is currently locked up in California State Correctional Facility where he will remain until his last day. Okay, so I didn't want to say it earlier and give like spoilers when we were actually talking about the book, but John Orr did go on to publish his writings from jail. So this is one book that you can actually go and purchase on Amazon. I wouldn't recommend it. All the reviews are terrible, but you can actually go 
look at them read the reviews read the synopsis it's this book and i think two or three others but all the the reviews say that they're all trash so there's that in glendale there was about 70 to 80 fires before his arrest and the year after there were only two some detectives and arson investigators think that John Orr could have maybe set up to 2,000 fires in the time that he was active, small and large. Through and through, he remained his innocence and still to this day maintains his innocence and he thinks he's gonna get out of jail. But that is a wrap on another true crime case here on the channel. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, What's going to be our question this week? Okay, so if you made it to the end of the video, I'll let me know your favorite comfort food in the comments. Mine is gravy. I like rice and gravy, smothered chicken, smother anything over some rice. I love rice. <laughs> but that is it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe before you leave, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye.